So back to delta G. We've been talking for a little bit about delta G, um, something that I have sort of ignored prior to now is that delta G that we've been talking about is delta G with this little knot up here, this little zero up top, this little thing that says this is delta G standard. The one without that is delta G non-standard. So we have a question of how does G standard and non-standard change during the course of a reaction? So if we look at a typical Gibbs free energy plot, at a certain point we have the G value, the Gibbs free energy value of free floating gaseous atoms. If those free floating gaseous atoms combine to form something that is actually our reactants, they're going to be on this lower shelf delta G standard of our reactants. Well, delta G standard officially means standard conditions and standard conditions for a liquid, for, for a solution is one molar, for a gas is one atmosphere. So let's say we have a one molar solution here. Our reactant is a one molar solution. What if we have a reactant that's not one molar? Our reactant is 0.05 molar solution. Is our delta G the same for that as, is, as it was for a one molar? Absolutely not. The way that you relate a standard delta G and what's now a non-standard delta G is with this little correction factor. So we've got delta G standard plus this correction factor gives delta G non-standard. So this correction factor is R times D times the ln of the new concentration divided by one molar. So it's really just ln of the new concentration because divided by one molar doesn't make a difference. This R that we're talking about here is the um, R that you're familiar with from thermodynamics things, 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Um, so if you have a delta G standard plus this correction factor for a 0.05 molar solution, your Gibbs free energy is at a lower value than the one molar solution. So the overall change, the overall Gibbs free energy for 0.05 molar is really at that bottom shelf. As you point out that if it's gases, it's the pressure of the gas, the new pressure of the gas over one atmosphere. So is this correction factor significant? Absolutely. If you plug in some values for it using the 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin at room temperature, 298 Kelvin, you get negative 7.42 kilojoules per mole. 7.42 kilojoules, that's pretty significant. So delta G standard and non-standard, knowing the difference is kind of important. So what does this mean? Bear with me while we run through some math. Well, let's run through some math. We say if we have reactants being converted to products, one way we can calculate delta G for that reaction is we can do delta G of the products minus delta G of the reactants. Note that I put in standard values there. Well, what if I don't want standard values? What if I want non-standard delta G? Delta G of the reaction at non-standard conditions, I need to do delta G of the products plus my correction factor. So that's delta G standard of the products plus RT LN times the concentration of products. So that is delta G standard plus correction factor minus delta G standard for the reactants plus the correction factor, RT, LN, reactants. Run out of space. So it's delta G, so the delta G non-standard of the products is delta G standard plus RT correction factor Delta G non-standard of the reactants is delta G standard plus the correction factor. So 
bear with me. If I gather some terms together, I can gather my two delta G's together. Delta G non-standard here, still doing non-standard. Delta G products, it's just a P now, sorry, get over it. Minus delta G reactants, standard. I'm gathering these two terms together. Plus, I'm gonna put it in parentheses just for cleanliness, not for necessity. Plus, RT Atlanta products. Plus, nope, minus, sorry, very sorry, minus RT LN of reactants. I'm about to make it smaller where you can actually read it. But, yep, that says reactants over there. This delta G product minus reactants, oh, look, that's delta G of the reaction standard from up there. So this becomes delta G standard of the reaction. So delta G non-standard is equal to delta G standard of the reaction. Plus, what if I factor out an RT while I'm at it? RT times the LN of the products, yep, it's just P, minus LN of the reactants. Yep, it's just R. All of a sudden I have space and I don't use it. So delta G of the reaction, standard, plus RT, factoring out an RT right here as well, to become that, multiplied by LN of products minus LN of reactants. But LN rules say when you subtract LNs, it's really like dividing by the things you're taking the LN of, right? So delta G standard of the reaction plus RT LN of products, concentration of products over concentration of reactants is equal to my delta G non-standard. So hopefully you recognize this term pretty well. Products of reactants, products of reactants, products of reactants. That's what we said for the whole last month. So this equation then gets simplified to delta G standard of the reaction plus RT LN of Q. What? What the heck is Q? Remember Q and K are related. Q is officially the reaction quotient, but the details, we don't have to be super, um, we don't have to remember those super well right now, but Q and K are the same as far as how you find them, but K is at equilibrium and Q as it is at any time other than equilibrium. So we're saying delta G non-standard is at some condition other than equilibrium. Q is also at some condition other than equilibrium. So this equation we will use quite frequently. Well, let's do some more stuff with this equation. So, If you didn't follow along with all that math derivation, I understand, I apologize, I forgive you, but what, what's the take home message? Why do we care about delta G standard and delta G non-standard? Well, delta G standard is what we can measure, what, what we can find in textbook tables, in Google tables, in all kinds of things. Delta G standard is one molar conditions, 25 degrees Celsius, it's, typical conditions for us to use. But we don't really care about that very much. We want to know whether a reaction is spontaneous. And it's really, truly delta G non-standard that helps us determine whether a reaction is spontaneous or not. So if we're looking at delta G non-standard, that's what we really want to know about. Delta G standard is all we can find in the back of the textbook. So we use that equation that we just walked through how to come up with. This equation has another added benefit. If we, yep, we already said that. If we, oh yeah, okay, sure, sure. If we, oh, it. if we, <laughs> if we look at that equation and say, at equilibrium, what is delta G equal to? 
at equilibrium, it's actually delta G non-standard that equals zero. It's not delta G standard that equals zero, it's delta G non-standard that equals zero at equilibrium. And at equilibrium, it's not Q we're talking about, it's K that's in question. So Q becomes K in that equation and delta G reaction equals zero. Shuffling things around to solve for delta G standard, we get our equation that we saw once before, delta G standard is equal to negative RT ln of K. That equation is a super important equation that we will see quite a lot throughout the remainder of this um, thermodynamics unit. Let's use it a little bit. If we do some math, ready for some math? Of course you are. The delta G standard value for the following reaction is equal to negative 33.4 kilojoules. What's the value for the equilibrium constant at 298 Kelvin? How the heck do we do that? Well, we use our equation. We use our equation, delta G standard is equal to negative RT ln of K. And we know that delta G standard is 33.4 kilojoules. We know that R is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And temperature that they're asking about is two, asking us about is 298 Kelvin ln of K. There's a problem here. What's my problem? R is in the unit of joules. G is in the unit of kilojoules. So let's make that G actually joules. Negative 33,400 joules. So if I rearrange my equation, divide by negative 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin times 298 Kelvin, that equals ln of K. If you do that math, ln of K equals 13.48. And how do you solve for K when you have an ln value? Each of the, so you e to both sides and you get K equals 7.156 times 10 to the fifth power. This is a Kp value because that's what they're asking us for. Um, hopefully things match up. We have a negative delta G, so the reaction is spontaneous. We have a positive, very big positive K value. The reaction is spontaneous. As long as that's in alignment, all is well. Back to the PowerPoint. Let's go. So we've said that K changes with temperature. It's been a while since I said that, but maybe, hopefully you remember it, but K changes with temperature. But how do we figure out how much K changes with temperature? We've got two equations for delta G standard. Delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. All of those are standard. And delta G standard equals negative RT ln of K. If we set those two equations equal to each other, we can solve for ln of K if we want to see how K changes with temperature. So solve that for ln of K. That means divide both sides by negative RT. Simplifying that equation a little bit and canceling out this T over T here we get this. Ln K is equal to negative delta H over R times one over T plus, negative times negative cancels out, plus delta S over R. The reason I wrote it in this way where it's negative delta H over R times one over T is because I wanted it in the Y equals MX plus B format in the point slope, no, no, slope intercept format for the equation. So the reason I wanted in slope intercept is because if I plot L and a K on the Y axis, ding, 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 got it. If I plot one over T on the X axis, ding, 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 got it. And I plot some data. There's some data. This reaction can tell me how K changes as temperature changes. This plot can tell me how K changes as temperature changes. So, this reaction is in an endothermic or exothermic. The slope is negative. 
So for the slope to be negative, it must mean that this delta H value is a positive number. Therefore, this reaction data must be for an endothermic reaction. One more thing, you will see this equation written this way sometimes. As I said before, this is the slope intercept form. We'll use it pretty steadily, but this is the slope point slope form. If you're given two data points, you can figure out um, the slope of the line given only two points. But we like the slope intercept quite a bit. And when we do some lab data processing soon, we will use this point, this slope intercept form so that we can calculate delta H of our reaction. That's the end of thermodynamics. I hope you enjoyed it.